I'm Rosemary Wright, and I'll be with you for this webinar. And I am one of the PMP instructors and trainers with LectureOn. And I guess my first question would be, uh, what propelled you to have the interest in the PMP designation? So, um, you know, if you'd like to share, um, you know, uh, please just give me a, an idea of why you're interested in the PMP. Well, that's fine. We don't have to. And I won't call on people because I don't want this to be uncomfortable, but I do like to have interactive sessions even in my trainings. But what I'll do is why don't I just go ahead and, uh, you know, begin our, our presentation for today. Uh, I'll give you a brief agenda of what I'd like to, to cover. Um, I'll go through some of the business decisions that you make um, by being a PMP or just being a, a business manager. but uh, the PMP is a highly respected credential. So today we will discuss, um, you know, why we're here, which is the first thing. I just want to let you know that I've been, um, you know, training for a couple of years now, and I really, really enjoy it. But I'll give you a little bit more about me as in a, in the next couple of slides. But more of um, what business questions are we going to answer? by using the, the PMP formula or framework. Um, you know, it's a recognized framework for more than 2.9 million people in the world, and it's issued by PMI.org. And so it helps us um, put a project together, keep it on track, answer those key questions of are you on track, or if not, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to bring it through to the end? Do I need to get more money? Do I need to get more time? You know, what are the risks? What are those probability of the risks? What's the impact? Um, if the risk happens, what do you plan to do about it? How do you manage your stakeholders? Every, almost everybody in a building, it could be potentially a stakeholder if you're bringing in a new enterprise software system, let's say. However, you typically start with a clear chain of like a key sponsor and key stakeholders. But, you know, that's why um, the PIMBA, Project Management Body of Knowledge, um, that's the guidebook for the PMP designation, states that, you know, communication is more than 90% of being a PM. And that's about right when you're dealing with stakeholders and keeping them happy. And then is this a good career path? Uh, a decision to take your career into your own hands and, and do something to advance yourself. And I can resoundingly say, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not making a commission or anything off of what I'm telling you today. I'm, you know, I'm making no money for um, an endorsement for PMI.org. If I train a class for Lecturon, they would uh, retain my services to train the class. But but I do not want you to think that I'm saying these things to earn, you know, commissions, et cetera, because these organizations are very, very substantial. Uh, basically, Lecturon um, can really empower you to take your career in your hands. And um, in a very short time, Lecturon has uh, made a difference or trained more than 50,000 professionals in 100 plus or organizations across the globe. Uh, there's 200 product offerings, so there's trainings, 500 plus instructors, 50,000 plus customers, and 200 plus locations around the world. And so it's a very substantial company uh, that gives a very, very value-oriented training to your organization to augment your your staffing skills, your corporate skills, and your personal professional goals. Due to this COVID-19 issue that the world is experiencing, Lecturon and I decided to do this seminar to announce that um, now is the time for you to take advantage of, I guess, being quarantined or having more time on your hands. And um, so therefore, Lecturons made a special announcement that there will be up to 50% scholarships available for the PMP training program, the course PMP training course. 
if you have interest, Jenny Thomas at Lecturon is the contact. You've probably been in contact with her to set up this meeting. And then at the end of our deck or our presentation, I'll, I'll show you that again, this info again. PMI has also changed their exam uh, practices, and you can now take the PMP exam at home through like a Pearson or a testing center. And they have decided to keep the exam, uh, the PMP curriculum or exam the same uh, until at least January of next year, where they were planning to change that this July, this past, or this, this July, that's not the case any longer. And so current um, offerings, Pinbox 6th edition, current blueprint for the exam, and current curriculum will remain the same for this year. And Lecturon is um, supporting the initiatives to help you get your PMP and to provide the training and assist you. Uh, here's a little bit about me. I started my PMI journey in 2007. Uh, I was living in the Midwest of the US and um, I knew I was working on a lot of projects and I was doing okay. I don't think I was doing great. And so I said to myself, oh, I really have to learn more. And boy, is the rest history. This is the one of the best decisions I've ever made, honestly. So since that time, I became a PMP certified in 2012. I've held a PMI board of directors positions on a local and global level. I highly endorse the organization, very, very solid organization. And I have been a startup, department startup person for some major companies uh, developing first time initiatives, normally um, with sales and marketing as a key stakeholder and putting in voice of customer or customer satisfaction measurement systems. Allstate, Walmart.com, Kodak, Philip Morris, and Health. PMI, as I said, is a very, very valuable organization to PMP because it's it's the governing body for um, the PMP designation. It holds a lot of prestige. Uh, when you are certified, um, you know you are uh, being certified by PMI.org that you have a proficiency to use the PMBOK framework, project management body of knowledge framework, uh, to conduct a project. And that gives you the rigor. And uh, because we are defining from a scrap of paper, basically, uh, projects are new events to a company, typically where operations are the ongoing um, operations of the organization. So you are defining something normally that never existed before, which is why we use the framework. Um, so PMI had the 50th anniversary anniversary in 2019 and uh, there's just a myriad of resources uh, for you to avail yourself if you become a member of the PMI uh, you also have premium access to projectmanagement.com which has every single template or document or white paper or question answer that you could even think of we don't have to start from scratch or reinvent the wheel that's what I like about you know this organization. It's so um, it's constantly you know refreshing and getting better and putting new you know information in there. And there, therefore, when you are um, a PMP, you would go ahead and continue your education with 60 continuing PDUs or professional development units every three years. Uh, and so. To sit for the PMP exam, if you have a bachelor's degree, you need a 35-hour educational seminar that Lecturon would provide in their training. Um, and then you would also have to have the 4,500 project hours on the job. Um, if you have just the high school or you know, no bachelor's, then you have the 7,500 hours of on-the-job experience. Here are the current um, certifications that the PMI is 
offering at this time. Agile is happening faster than fast, and that's where it's more, you know, um, it's not as traditional and planned and linear and sequential. It's more of let's run in sprints because we really don't know what we're doing and we'll define as we go. So those are the two hot PMP Agile, they're really two hot certifications that most companies are looking for right now. But you can get, you know, all of these other certs currently. And there are a lot more things um, for the next phase of development that will be coming down the pipe. Um, PMI has just recently, uh, this last year, changed uh, CEOs. And it's a person that is highly entrepreneurial and you know taking on you know the project ties world that we're in and the numbers are staggering the amount of projects that need to be delivered to sustain our global living and professions now i know we're in a very strange time right now but it's only a matter of time before we will be back to some normalcy normalcy and then of course we will be back to um, a very strong economies, companies, you know, wanting to do projects, uh, deliver new things to customers. So this is a momentary um, setback, I guess, but that's why we can take advantage of this time. So the basics. I am just going to go through the very top level basics of building the a project from the PMBOK or the PMP framework. Um, this talk is going to center on, okay, I don't, I don't want to be focused on just memorizing formulas, you know. Your key stakeholders and sponsors aren't going to come, come up and say, can you do this formula for me and come back tomorrow? Well, no. They're going to say, where are you on the project? Are you, at, are you where you thought you would be? What's the probability of this risk happening? If, if you have the same amount of slippage starting from today, what's it gonna to take to complete? Now, these are the discussions you're going to have to have in order to run the project, but we can't pull numbers from the sky. So obviously there is a, a, a large amount of rigor and discipline and building the project so that we can accurately say where are we and where do we want to be so the framework for the pmp process is iterative this is the non-agile uh, linear sequential waterfall cascading type of project layout if you will so we will initiate we will plan we will execute we will monitor and control, and we will close. And as you can see, the initiating process and the closing process are sort of a one and a done. Then everything in the circle or in the middle is where we are planning, doing more planning and planning. Then we're gonna execute on the plan, and then we're gonna monitor and control to make sure we are executing on the plan. And then we're going to see if something changes, and then we're going to go through a change request or a change control board, or we're going to, you know, document that change, and then we're going to go back and see how it changes our plan, update everything, and then start executing, and then monitor, monitoring and controlling. So, you know, these are living documents that we are doing with our rigor. You know, we're being trained to be certified to say, yes, I've taken into account all the five uh, processes, uh, the 10 knowledge areas, and the 49 activities that PMI says we should do to build a project. I like this one because it, this graph really shows the interrelationship of everything. And so what we are doing is we are um, stirring the soup. Uh, bringing everything together, <clears throat> everything everything that I would say hits my desk probably applies to two or three other areas um, in a project. So what the PMP class teaches us or the PMP boot camp teaches us 
is how to walk through all of these processes to build a project. It simply starts with a charter that allows me to put together a team, allows me to spend money, the sponsor knows what the high level deliverables are, and we get started. Then we have to know our scope. Of course, with that comes with requirements. And so I'm sure all of you or some of you are in some stage of project management now. So these terms aren't you know, probably foreign to you, but this is the rigor by which we will walk through building the project. Requirements are very, very important, but I have to know my schedule, excuse me, my scope. I have to know my schedule and I have to know my cost. Those are known as the triple, cons triple constraints, meaning we are constantly looking at scope and schedule and cost and making trade-offs and making decisions and looking at constraints and, and all of those things. And so then uh, scope, schedule, and cost are the triple constraints plus quality because, of course, we have to keep a quality in everything that we do and that is one thing that we always have to make sure that we um, are doing the highest quality however a lower grade maybe on some steel for a construction project that you know will allow a different grade is different from poor quality we never would do poor quality but we have to make trade-offs so as we are walking through here, we're also identifying stakeholders. You know, you need champions, you need um, team players, you need people who are uh, needing to be informed by your project, and you need to make sure they have the talking points and you're keeping them happy, you know, um, because if they're not happy, guess what? <laughs> you're not happy <laughs> and you'll know if they're not happy believe me <laughs> some of them are very vocal and you're gonna have to have a thick skin i'll tell you but but once they know you're a pmp and that you've done the rigor and that you know what you're talking about a lot of those difficult stakeholders will back off you have to prove yourself a little bit and you'll be tested but that's what we'll also touch on when we get you know to the uh, since further slides, uh, the difficult stakeholder. So now we have started our project. We know the scope. We've delineated the scope documents down to task activity or, you know, eight hours of time or lowest level of decomposition that makes sense. We can put, give the task out to a resource or get the resources to do it. And a resource doesn't always have to be a human capital. It could be a, a server or a cloud space, or it could be um, Komatsu front end loader. Uh, then we schedule activities. What's going to come first? What's going to come next? Uh, you know, and these are very important discussions because I'm going to go through the ways in which the three top ways that we manage our project and answer business decisions. And it's all based upon, you know, scope, schedule, cost, with resources and all the other things. But the key ways we're going to be measuring and reporting are based on the triple constraint. So after we know where our stakeholders are, um, are they informed, are they, not informed do they need to be informed informed do they need to be consulted you know is our key sponsor getting all the info they need then we have to make sure that we have all the resources to do this so we might have to have contract labor we may have to have outside resources we may have a preferred vendor list that we're going to use then we may have to according to our organization and they go to the PMO and say, I need this kind of resource, 40% uh, allocation for six weeks, starting three three weeks from now. And you know, you may have to go to a, a functional manager and, and say, okay, I need 
um, to, I guess, borrow or you know, utilize your resource. And that's where the communications is very, very important. There's a lot of soft skills uh, that go along with being a project manager. And I'd say some of the soft skills are probably more important than technical. Um, as my projects have advanced, I have uh, learned to uh, have more programming knowledge, more technical knowledge, just so I can have the conversations that I need to have um, with team members and all the rest. But communication and management is very, very important because you're managing people who don't typically report to you uh, in order to function and to to function and to take the initiatives so um you know some people make you know project management jokes like you know it's trying to herd cats and etc cetera, etc cetera. but you know there's a fine art and science to it and uh, that's where we in also this framework we learn how to be better managers of our time of people of resources of project scope, of the schedule, of the cost, you know, anything goes on in this project, uh, people are going to come to your desk and say, what's going on? And you need to have the answers or be able to say, I will get back to you. So risks, those are very important areas to always take into consideration because in business, we're always, always uh, or in life, I guess you could say, we are always managing risk. And so your risk discussions are going to be along the lines of, okay, uh, Mr. Miss sponsor, stakeholder, uh, we have this potential risk. Well, okay, the stakeholder says, what's the probability of it happening? Well, you know, you've had to have some very precise conversations with your team to come up with your risk register to say, we think that's a 30% probability because maybe you've looked at previous projects in the in the company or you've done some white paper analysis uh, with PMI. Oh, you've had some personal experience with one of these projects in another company or in the same company, maybe in a different department. So I think, you know, so the, you know, things are gonna be very logical when you're speaking with people about your projects. And that's why we can use this training to anticipate the logic. When we learn the logic of how the project works, we can um, anticipate the discussions. We can anticipate the logical next questions. And we can have answers to those when we sit down. So we have positive interactions and we can take away some action steps instead of saying all the time, I'll get back to you. Now, sometimes that's good, but most of the time we really want to anticipate. So risk comes in a couple of varieties. Okay, what's the probability of it happening? If it happens, what's the impact? What's it gonna do to my cost? And what's it gonna do to my schedule? You know, that is a fairly straightforward discussion that we as PMPs and as trained professionals understand the interrelationship of all of these components so that I know how it's going to impact everything. So these are known as the knowledge areas. Now we're looking at the process groups that I had uh, initially told us that we have the five process groups. And in the training, we would go into much deeper um, uh, discussions of each of the activities and the process by which we do it. And uh, I'll just go ahead and slide. We have ETOs, inputs, process, tools, and outputs. And we're, we, you know, very carefully work through the process of building the framework in order to know how we're going to put all this together. So when we initiate, we are starting our project. And so we develop a charter and we identify the first level of stakeholders. Then we start our planning. 
planning is, if you look at it, it's a larger percentage even than executing. Think about this. We are doing more planning than we are doing executing. That's how important planning is. And that comes with very definitively, you know, speaking about what's the scope, what are the requirements, what's the delineation of the tasks, what's the schedule, um, you know, which comes first, what's, what's a predecessor, what's a successor, what's a dependency, and then what is the cost. Now, those are the three areas plus risk and stakeholder management I wanted to discuss in this session because it sets the groundwork for a lot of the business decisions that can be answered and supported by these analyses. And of, of course, there's formulas involved and there's much more specificity that we go into, but I wanted to show the benefit of PMP designation from a business standpoint. So you can see that a project manager plans to plan. We plan how we are going to plan. Like if the building is on fire, we're going to plan how we get out of the building. I mean, you're, you're catching the drift, I'm sure. Then we go into executing. That's where we are actually doing the work. But you have to know, do you need your programmer in week six or week eight? What if your schedule gets off and that programmer isn't available in two more weeks? You know, these that's why it's so important to have a very uh, precise way to know where we are on our project every day. So when the executing begins, we're doing the work. We have team members um, that are doing the work. They understand it. They know the task. It's been delineated, it's been explained, there's requirement documents, there's business requirement documents, there might be marketing requirement documents, you know, there's tech specs, you know, all of that. And uh, you have very, very precise definitions of what needs to be done, and then we start, we pull the trigger. Then we are monitoring and controlling. So the major PM role, or PMP role, is to watch that everything gets done, when it's supposed to get done, how it's supposed to get done, and within scope, cost, and schedule, and that we watch out for the risks. Now, that's not to say that you may not have people on your team who are performing some of these tasks. Because look, there's only eight hours or 10 hours in the day. I mean, this is a lot, you know, to oversee. But fortunately, the sophisticated project management software uh, programs are just phenomenal in, and help so much in, you know, when you set up the model, you, you're tying everything to what it's related to. So when you make a change, it kind of carries forward so that helps tremendously, but you might have a quality specialist, a tech spec, a quality specialist. You know, you may have um, somebody who's watching communications and, and maybe giving out the communications to the corporate newsletter, you know, whatever. So you're just making sure that everything is getting done. So then once we have found out that we've delivered um, what needs to be delivered, it's approved, validated and approved and accepted, then we will close our project. So this is the format, but as you can see, there's 49 activities, there's five processes that we'll go through and um, a lot of rigor. And we have the 10 knowledge areas, which you can think of as like subsidiary plans. These are the subsidiary plans you are putting in to your overall project plan. And your PMP, PIMBA, Project Management Body of Knowledge Framework, will give you the 
process steps to conduct all of these activities. And as I said before, these are um, the PMBOK framework is very process driven. I mean, it's it's so process driven. You're going to fall asleep maybe <laughs> when you're reading a PMBOK, and I I certainly am not going to blame you, but I'm going to tell you you have to read it, and you probably better read it twice. And I even get a little bit of class time ahead of lunch a couple of times just so that you can get some more reading done, because there's no way around it. So it's a little dry. It's not the summer beach read, but it's essential. It's our Bible for project management. And believe me, uh, 2.9 million people can't be wrong. They all know that it's good for to help them run projects. It's good for their career. And it's good to help them answer the business decisions that need to be answered if you're trying to put together and run and manage a project. So ETOs, the ETOs are um, the process by which Project Management Institute, PMI, suggests that if you don't have any idea how to do a particular activity, let's just say, you know, I came along to, oh gosh, risk. Let's just say I came to risk and I'm not that familiar with it. So one of the first steps might be, you know, do some qualitative assessments of your risk, like just do that brainstorming with your team, come up with the list. Well, after you do that, you've got some tools and techniques you can use to try to delineate, is that a 30% probability? Is that a 50%? Is that a, you know, I can't pick numbers out of the sky because the very time I state a number, 30%, the first question is going to be, okay, fine. but what how did you come up with that number what was your process what was your forecasting method what kind of research did you do you know is that is that a, a live or die number or is that a shoot from the hip number and there's all kinds of sometimes you are just having a very general conversation okay i think it's between here or if i need to be specific and say no I, i'm going to you know we're going to spend two million dollars on this decision well you're going to do a lot more research so, but these ETOs, inputs, tools, techniques, lead to outputs. And that's what works us through the project management framework, PMBOK framework. So what does it take to be a PMP or a good project management manager? Well, you know, it's definitely a, um, the art and the science. It's definitely some hard skills, which a PMP would be a hard skill. It might, it's, you know, the talent triangle that PMI thinks that people need to have are leadership, um, strategy, and technical knowledge. And so when you do get your, your uh, PMP, every three years you get those 60 units of continuing education or professional development units, you have to get a certain amount in each of the triangles of skills that PMI thinks that a good project manager needs to have so you know there are legitimate skills we need to have but i'm telling you you have to be a change agent because you're bringing something new to an organization that didn't exist before you're bringing something that is in operations you know you're bringing something new and so you have to manage the change and that takes a lot of you know professional uh, professionalism some communication skills diplomacy confidentiality, um, um, gusto, stamina, uh, you know, not to be afraid to take the leap because after you've done all of your, you know, fact finding, someone has to pull the trigger and that's you. Uh, so you have to be comfortable you know, with changing complex and dynamic environment. People skills, absolutely essential. And the broad and flexible toolkit of techniques, and that's what the PMP teaches us. We're coming with this toolbox. And um, it's very important that we carry this toolbox. And the PMP designation after our name will tell us that we have 
a proficiency in each of the critical skills to be a PMP uh, according to the PMI. And that says a lot. But what we have to do is to be able to react to the business implications of the information. You know, I can take the calculator out, I can sit at the desk and, you know, draw flow charts all night, you know, but what am I going to do? What decisions am I going to make? You know, have I set up the proper and appropriate uh, governance structure, you know, to, to manage my project? Does the company have the appropriate governance structure? If I'm, if I come in, I come in a lot to start a department or some function, maybe the corporate readiness is a little, you know, behind. Okay, that doesn't mean I can't get my project done. It just gives me a, a little bit of an extra headache. I still have to get it done. So I've got to be able to say, okay, here's where we are. And here's the framework I know I have to put in for a successful project. And if I do the due diligence to do at least that much, I have the greatest chance of success. Um, we can still have failure, believe me. Uh, some of the biggest things I've ever learned have been through some failures, um, through some part of my own, through maybe somebody on my team, maybe from a corporate readiness standpoint, maybe from a political situation. Yes, it's going to happen, but it can't stop us from moving ahead and having the confidence to say, I'm skilled and trained, and what I don't know, I can definitely find it in my projectmanagement.com um, community linked to PMI.org. 2.9 million people have probably contributed in an area, or some of those people have probably contributed to an area where I need to learn more. So we have to be on the ready to use this diligence to make informed decisions, pull the trigger, and put in the due diligence to do the best we can to be successful. Because um, basically uh, the US Marine Corps teaches this and I have found this method to be you know, pretty important because uh, I can remember, I'm still afraid to make big decisions of course, I'm just, I'm maybe, maybe Afraid isn't the word, but apprehensive. I mean, I, I definitely learned, is this a $2 million decision or is this a what's to have for lunch? I mean, we all know that for sure. So, you know, we know how much info we need to make an informed decision. But then once you've done, let's say, 70% of what you need, how much more important is it for you to waste another week, three days, six months getting to 100% because 100% certainty isn't there. So if we follow the framework of the PIMBA as much as possible, we are getting definitely to more than 70% of understanding what we need to know to ensure our success. You know, we can ask our questions, you know, is it better to do something versus nothing? Well, the answer is yes, but I need to make informed decisions. I'm also being given the license to spend the company's money. And I have to spend it even more carefully than I would spend my own. You know, how bad could it be if I make the wrong decision? And that's what, when you look into your risk analysis, you look into your procurement, you look into, do we have an outside resource? Do we lease or buy? Do we work internally or externally? You know, this is the framework we're going through to make our decisions. Will I get fired if my decision doesn't work? Um, probably not, but you need to show that you have done the best you could possibly do given the, the circumstances. And then if the chips fall, well, you at least know that you did your absolute very best, and that's why we work as professionals to continue to get better and better and better. We make mistakes, we learn from them, and we keep going. And that's why Project Management Institute in the PNP designation stresses the lessons learned. 
we are constantly passing along the knowledge that we are all learning to uh, improve the profession and to make sure that we're, I learned this and I want you to know it too, type of thing. And then what's my track record? Well, more than likely, you're going to tell me that uh, you made far more good decisions than bad decisions. And that's, that's a win. So um, how are we going to understand what the project needs to do? Well, as I said before, we need to understand the triple constraints. And when you simply realize that this framework just does the very basic logical progression of defining what has to get done. The who, what, where, when, why, and how. And then we have data analytical tools that are going to allow us to tell us where we are in those areas and then give variance reports or status reports or keep things on track by using some scheduling techniques, network diagramming, earn value. And this is what we're going to be going over now. I wanted to show the business applications of the PMP or managing a project to this standard. Uh, the challenges for project management, they're not secret. You know, everybody who manages projects has all of these to consider and even more. That's why we have the 10 knowledge areas or the 10, 10 whole subsidiary plans for a project. We go through a planning process that is even greater than the executing. And that is why we are constantly monitoring and controlling. And we are given the tools to do that. You know, the, the current project management challenges, you know, your key stakeholder are, are you spending my budget dollar appropriately? Are you going to go over budget? Um, what if we reach budget and it's not really what I thought? And that's what the waterfall and linear and sequential uh, uh, project management process would sometimes lead to 10 months down the road, 11 months down the road, and do you really have what you need or has everything changed? And that's when the agile methodology has kicked in, and that's why in the Pinbox 6 edition, which is what we are in now, the 6th edition, uh, about 50% of it is discussing Agile, but the PMP designation is for the uh, waterfall linear sequential project management techniques, and the Agile CERT, ACP, is for the Agile um, methodology. Both are in very, very high demand at this time. So we always want to be watching our challenges and basically doing a balancing act uh, between how are we going to minimize, capitalize, and just get the job done. I mean, I know that sounds awfully simplistic, but that's what we're doing. But we're given a framework. So I'm going to go over scope, schedule, and cost briefly just because those are the triple constraints. And those where we do our biggest um, financial calculations to understand where we are in our project in order to answer the questions of where are you and um, et cetera. So we have to understand, of course, what has to be done. Um, we have to have the, the stakeholder definitely you know, sign off and say, yes, this is what I want. We may have a BA, a business analyst, that does our requirements for us, or we may have somebody on the team do it, or we may do it collectively. And um, if you don't have a BA, that's, that's fine, but there's also a business analyst um, certification from PMI, if you have interest in that area. Um, the other thing I'll mention for PMI, there are um, knowledge area books, um, bodies of knowledge for these major areas such as scope management, risk management, WBS, 
et cetera, et cetera. So you, know, you can get a lot more deep dives in addition to the pin box on how to get up to speed on doing the best we can on all of these areas to put together a project. So scope, we obviously have to understand what needs to be done. We need to have it decomposed down to the lowest level that makes sense. Like I'm not gonna say validate uh, invoices, say pick up telephone, call accounting. You know, we're gonna drop it down to what makes sense. But we have to have it in clear work packages that we can manage and assign to people because it's going to lead to all the other things that we need. So why would we use a work breakdown structure? Well, we have to make it, you know, come down to the lowest level um, that is manageable or that's logical or makes sense, but that will allow us to better monitor. It will allow us to make sure we don't get scope creep. So we're gonna keep it to the tasks that are delineated in the project schedule or in the project tasks or activities. And it's going to allow us to make sure that we're not trying to do too much. You know, what is the minimum viable product that we need to do for this project, for the scope, for the cost, and for the time or schedule? So when we are delivering, you know, the work breakdown structure, you know, the key business questions are okay. This, these are the, the sequence of, the high level sequence of events that we have to put together, you know, for this project. But the business decisions are, you know, what are we actually delivering? What are we not delivering? Out of scope is a very critical discussion, you know, in all of these meetings or in, you know, hey, that's a great idea, that's just out of scope. You know, is there a deadline? Do we have a deadline? Or are we going to give the deadline? A lot of times I've, I'm given the, hey, tell me what it's gonna cost and how long it's gonna take and what resources you need. Sometimes I'm handed the charter to start the, the project. Sometimes I have to create the charter with the team. So it just depends on how the company is structured. And that's another thing that P and P will discuss is how we can look at an organizational structure and say, okay, this is how, this is how I'm gonna get through this quote unquote maze. I understand what kind of structure I'm dealing with. So what's gonna be success? What we would call success? Um, who is the client really? So do I have a sponsor? Do I have an internal end user? And do I have an external customer? Who is really the person we're trying to please? And the point of contacts, et cetera. But getting down to these low levels of detail allows us to make sure we haven't uh, forgotten any tasks. We make sure that there's no gaps. So if it doesn't get to our work breakdown structure, it's not getting done. And we need to make sure that that is the entire comprehensive scope of work. So we break it down. So then we can move to dependencies and schedules and sequencing. So in putting together this WBS work breakdown structure by going through the predecessor, successors, dependencies for each of the tasks, I might may find some things that we hadn't considered. And the reason I need to know the schedule is so that I can give a time, I can get resources, and I can give stakeholders time when to expect the deliverables key milestones. So what we're going to want to do is make sure that we plan how we will develop the schedule, define all the activities, and the activities go into the, the WBS, the key high level, and then decompose it down. But then which comes first? What's the activity duration? What's my schedule? And then we'll monitor it. The monitoring the schedule and developing the schedule is very important. It builds on all these other things, but that's where you're maybe given some constraints. You're maybe given, we have to have it by second quarter next year or forget it, you know, or 
we have to control this schedule. Uh, I'm slipping. I should have been here on Tuesday and I'm not. So what am I going to do about it? And that's where we have some techniques that I'm going to go over as well, which is why I'm going over scope, schedule, and cost. So the key business decisions for the schedule is like, does everybody know what they're doing? You know, uh, does everybody know who to hand off their task to or, or where they pick up from someone else on the team? You know, is everybody giving feedback? Are we watching? Do they have the tools? Are they empowered? Am I reporting on the schedule like weekly or maybe daily to a key stakeholder? Uh, do I have my complete schedule integrated to every single part of my um, project into all my knowledge areas? And then we get into cost because these things just go hand in hand. One, two, three. You really can't have any of these discussions independently because you got to know what to do. And I mean very precisely. I mean, we're doing top line. But, you know, there's a lot more to it, of course. But I just wanted to show the business view. And then we're going to have a schedule. So when are you going to have it? And what's in scope? What's out of scope? You know, when are you going to have it? And then what's it going to cost me? What kind of budget do I need? What kind of resources do I need? So we will go ahead and we will plan our, our cost management. So we, of course, have to have a budget or we may be given the budget or we may determine the budget, it all depends. Like I say, these are all new things for companies. So our PMP designation tells a company, I'm going to use, or I tell people, I'm going to use the PMBOK methodology framework to build the project. Uh, you know, And that says it all. If they're not that familiar with it, then I do give a little bit more. But Normally, that's another thing for having a framework or a, a standard. The reason we're having a standard is so we're all speaking the same language. So if we all speak English and we're all PMPs, we're pretty much going to be able to communicate because we're going to be following the same procedures, you know, effectively going about the goal in a similar fashion. However, it's only a framework and we have to tailor it to each of our projects. And then we get into cost. So cost is exactly what's it going to cost me. That's a very easy one, but we're going to want to monitor our cost very, very carefully. So you'll talk about how frequently am I going to look at my, my cost? How am I going to measure it? Measure it? Uh, do I have some cost thresholds? Uh, do I have some key metrics that the company, the PMO, tells me that if you run 20% over uh, schedule and cost, you have a hard stop until we figure out what's going on? But this is also where one of the major techniques of performance evaluation comes in, and that's the earned value. So for the business decisions that we need to be able to answer, and they're just very straightforward, well, what tools can I use to sequence my tasks and my resources? What is our progress versus the schedule? What is the cost versus the budget, meaning actual cost versus budget? If there is slippage, what will it take to complete if my run rate stays the same? But if it stays the same, what's that going to do? Okay, but we have techniques. We have tools and techniques to handle this, to answer these questions, to have workaround scenarios. That's how we have very important business decisions that we can take action from. So what risks are most probable? What are your mitigation strategies? So the business decisions that we need to be able to answer, we have to be able to set the schedule, monitor and control our schedule, we have to look at our critical path, which means the, the point in the project where each of the tasks don't have any buffer or slack or float. That's called the critical path analysis. Then we do that through network diagramming. 
And then we monitor the schedule and say, where are we on actual versus plan or budget? And that's the earned value. And these are the major techniques for answering business questions about your project, but we'll also go over risk because that's a very important um, discussion as well. So most of you have probably seen a Gantt chart, and that's this diagram in the middle. And the Gantt chart is the summary of milestone graphical representation of each of the activities. And the shading will tell you the percentage complete um, and what else needs to be done and also link to the dependencies. So when you are setting up your, your major task list, you are setting in your dependencies and things of that nature. So your Gantt chart is um, what your stakeholders may get um, on a visual just to see where you are. And what you'll need to know when we are putting this together is we need to be able to delineate the tasks down to the work breakdown structure level, which is this WBS1, WBS1.1, you know, levels down. And you can see we've got like work packages. And then what's it going to take to do each of those work packages? We're going to, we're going to identify the predecessors and the successor. So what has to happen before or what's the dependency and then what happens after? And then is it a start to finish task? Meaning this task has, no, excuse me, excuse me. Finish to start is, is the most common. So something has to finish before something starts. But there are different ways in which we look at how tasks are related in a network diagram so that we know like start to start, finish to start, finish to finish, etc. So that we can start to understand where we have some float or some slack or ways in which we can monitor the schedule in order to maybe make up some time. And that leads to our network diagram. So if I don't know these variables, okay, in this diagram to the bottom of this chart, and particularly the ones that are in red, because that's the critical path, meaning I have no wiggle room whatsoever on these tasks. So if any one of these work units they're red, gets off, the whole project's off. But we can manage in other ways. So we may not have much room here in the uh, critical path, but in other areas, by doing network diagramming, I may know where I have some float, some lead, some lag, where I can compress my schedule where I may be able to run two things in parallel, where I may be able to fast track to make up time. And that's why a very complicated diagram answers some very basic business questions about my project. And believe me, most project management softwares do this for you now. So we would load in the tasks, the durations, immediate predecessors, et cetera. And the rest of this will mainly calculate. So, you know, uh, for the PMP exam and in the training, we go through simple hand calculations because we have to understand the, the levers so that we can pull them. But um, a lot of these things are now in the MS project or in project software. But if I can't answer, if I don't know my project, tasks down to this level of detail, I probably won't be able to answer a lot of the business discussions or questions I'm going to have regarding when is it due? Are you on track? What's the cost? How are you going to make up time? Where can you run in parallel? What are you going to do around? What are you going to do to bring it back on track? That's why we have these tools and techniques. 
So why do we use a critical path? Um, just very simple. Uh, it's so that we can plan to get things done as quickly as possible, which is obviously our goal. And we want to obviously know which activities, that if they are delayed, will delay the entire project. That is really the most critical. And so that's why when we have a critical path item, everybody is eyes on it. I mean, we're on it. And we're watching to make sure that we don't get off critical path. Now, we're watching to make sure we're not off on any other task as well. But we definitely know how important this is to keep us on track. So how are we going to answer the questions about, well, where are you? Where are you versus where you thought you would be? Where are you on this Tuesday where you thought you would be? Okay, you're not where you wanted to be. Okay, so what does that mean? So if everybody has the same velocity, the same run rate, if everything goes the same, starting today, are we going to end on time? Or what are you going to do to make us end on time? Well, th those are very, very, uh, I guess, those are questions that come up frequently. <laughs> Those aren't, those aren't novel questions, and that's why PMI knows and the PMP designation framework, uh, PIMBA, teaches us how to have these analytical tools to answer these business, very basic business questions and gives us some tools and techniques in order to do some fast tracking, to go ahead and do some earned value calculations, you know, what we want to be able to find out from earned value is, you know, we need to be able to understand why this is happening. Why did the slippage happen? You know, root cause, you know, all of that. And, um, you know, the whole myriad of reasons why we're off track. Just so the earned value calculation is the comparison to the actual versus what we planned. And, you know, some people, uh, you know, get a little bothered by, oh, no, I can't understand that. And I had trouble with that for years, but it's really very straightforward and very simple. But once we find out that number or that slippage or that off track or whatever it's going to tell us or ahead of track, maybe, maybe we're ahead of schedule, we have to understand why uh, the root cause of that and what we're going to do about it. Those are the business issues. We can look up calculations all day long. You only have to memorize 20 to 25 formulas once in your life for the PMP exam. But you're going to be using these formulas and tools and techniques every single day that you run a project to answer some question about your project. And what the earned value is telling me on today, today, what was planned, what has been accomplished, and what has been spent. So don't get too concerned because in the trainings and the PMBOK, we'll go into a lot more detail, you know, on this, a lot more case studies, you know, examples, etc. I'm just trying to show you why formulas sometimes are necessary in order to answer the questions that we get on our projects. So the plan value, what did I plan? What was the planned cost of the work on this Tuesday or on today? The actual cost and the earned value. What should amount of the budget should have been spent? So the next logical question that comes is, okay, this is where you are, line in the sand, two day. Fine. Is everything going to stay the same on your schedule going forward, starting tomorrow or later on today? Are you still going to finish on time? Do you need more money? Can Do you have to do some fast tracking? Do you have to change some scheduling? Uh-oh, the resources that you needed for next week aren't going to be able to be used because you're not there yet and ready for them. I mean, that's why we're doing this. 
what's your budget of completion, your estimate to complete, if everything stayed the same. But if everything stays the same, we can't live by the, I guess, three-week delay. We're going to have to do something to fast track it. So, you know, this, these are the maneuvers, the levers we have to manage our project and go to our stakeholder and say, look, you know, here's where we are, but we have some workarounds. I've got some things to do. I can change this. I can run these two streams in parallel. I can ask you for more money. I can ask you for additional resources. If it's this critical, I can ask for overtime. You know, that's more money, more budget. But sometimes some things are so critical. Sometimes it's throw money at it. I don't care. Get it done. And I have heard that before. <laughs> I don't care. Get it done. <laughs> well, we don't write blank checks either. So here, are we over budget, behind schedule? So we're always looking at cost and schedule. And that's why in the business implications discussion we're having today, I wanted to use scope, cost, and schedule because there's such critical areas to how we're going to pull the levers to report on our um, project. And in very simple terms, you know, this is what earn value is telling us. You know, the plan value is the authorized budget. You know, just in layman's terms, the earn value is the work performed in terms of the budget, the actual cost, the actual cost incurred in the work performed, the budget at completion, that's the budgeted amount for the total work. See, it makes perfect logical sense. Estimate to complete or at, no, no, excuse me, estimate at completion with because then there's estimate to complete. So estimate at completion is the expected total cost of the project. The estimate to complete is the expected cost to finish all the remaining work. So as of today, this is what it's gonna take. And what is my variance? Every time we report on our project, we are reporting against um, baseline, scope, schedule, cost baseline and that's where we will always talk about the variance and earn value gives us a tool that we can say okay i really need to be able to quantify where we are on our project so i also said that the other key component was risk and that is true we are const we are constantly um looking at risk and managing that risk and so there are risk registers there's uh probability exercises um there's monte carlo simulations there's some very very sophisticated models we can use to take some variables and look at correlations and regressions and all of this and the very fact that we have all of those sophisticated techniques shows us how important managing risk is. And that's what we'll want to do. Um, in my weekly status reports, I typically say, you know, my top five risks are still these. Uh, here's our mitigation strategy and um, um, the the risk register is attached, and that's where you'll have your probability and you'll have your mitigation or your workaround. So you never have the discussion of risk unless you have, well, what's the probability? If it happens, what's the impact? All right, if it happens, what are you going to do about it? All right, you know. So, right, what is the scope? What is the schedule? What is the cost? Okay, where are you? Uh, versus where you thought you would be. Okay, we have some slippage. What does that do to the estimate to complete? Do you need more time? Do you need more money? Do you need more resource? Well, we don't have any of the above. So are you going to use some techniques like to fast track or to work two streams in parallel maybe? Do you know what your critical path is? I can't, you know, boy, we can't miss a mark on this line or on this uh, stream of activities. We're always looking at these risks. We also have to know who our stakeholders are. 
Are they neutral? Are they influencers? Are they adversaries? You know, are they inner corner? Not. Are they, you know, so having these discussions allows us to make sure that the appropriate people in the organization have the appropriate talking points about our project and our the the why we're doing the project for the company to what strategic effort is this project fulfilling and you know what is the status and what are the roadblocks because we're going to need somebody in the organization to take away roadblocks when we need that to happen. So um, this comes from the PMI actually. So it comes from Andrew Conrad, uh, February 14th in 2020, and it speaks about, well, in this article, you can get the five highest paying jobs for being a PMP, however, you know, just having the PMP designation really helps you manage your career. And um, in 2019, the average PM professional without the PMP cert uh, made more than $100,000. Um, and that was according to 9,000 PMs. And with the PMP cert, uh, that was increased uh, 23%. Uh, to more than 123,000. So, um, you know, it's a very important credential to have, and it's not just because of money. It gives you the framework and the toolkit uh, to be licensed or to have this designation and to know how to solve business problems in order to advance the project and then consequently advance your career. So um, the way that the um, PMI talks about the project or talks about a project manager, it's being responsible for all aspects of project delivery, leading, and directing cross-functional teams. Um, and so that probably sums it up. What I was trying to say, like what is the profile of, of a PMP? Well, if there's 209 million PMPs in the world, uh, there's probably 2.9 million profiles. We all are coming from different walks of life with different skills, different personalities, you know, different cultures, but we're bound by the designation and using the consistent framework. So we're certifying to a company that we know how to use the PMBOK framework in order to achieve the goal they're hiring us to, to do or to achieve their strategy. The 200 uh, PMP certi certificate exam is $555. Um, if you're not uh, a PMI, it's 405 if you are a member. It's $129 or $139 a year. Um, I think it just went up $10 uh, for the PMI membership. But believe me, it's been a consistent 129 for probably five or six years, so it doesn't go up very frequently. Uh, you would have the four hour time limit uh, for the exam and uh, the lecture on PMP training course would give you your 35 educational hours for preparing to sit for the exam. Um, in, that, in that comprehensive boot camp, you're given the, the nuts and the bolts. But then there's some self-study, some um, testing strategies, uh, some testing prep books. There are some test, test, uh, test tests, mock, mock tests that you would take before you sit for the exam. But um, you know it's not insurmountable, and now is a great time, especially since PMI is saying we can take the pin block or the PMP test at home. And Lecturon has decided to to assist people who are in this very unusual time now with the, the COVID-19 and um, let's come out of this better. Let's walk away with, you know, um, another skill and, um, you know, more tools in our toolkit. And uh, now is the time. So I want to say thank you. And um, 
we have time for some Q&A, or uh, you could write questions to, to Jenny. Let me put that back on there. And I would certainly be able to, to respond uh, to each and individual um, question. So um, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this is just a very, very high level business discussion of why the PMP designation helps us manage our business and manage a project to completion, successful completion. So thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions or would you like to um, write to Jenny? All right. Well, let me see. I think I have somebody in chat. Oh, okay. Here we go. Yes, Bella. Uh, is business case creation and justification approval included in PMP framework? Yes. That would be like the inputs to building the charter where you would possibly um, where you would possibly have to do a business case analysis, a feasibility study. Uh, what strategy are you, um, what strategy are you trying to accomplish for the company? Or this project will fulfill one of the strategic goals of the company. So yes, that's a great question, Bella. That's a input or a predecessor analysis to beginning the project or doing the business case. Um, the program um, is a four day boot camp. And so it's like eight hours a day um, with reading the PMBOK. The PMBOK is about 600 pages. And like I said, it's, it's a little heavy <laughs> to put it mildly, <laughs> but I give a little bit of class time ahead of lunch and then a couple hours at night keep us on track. Then after the four day boot camp, I meet with my students and I also, yeah, yeah at least six cups of Starbucks. <laughs> okay, but anyhow, then I meet with my students and then we go through like some, some um, mock tests. You know, they'll have a, we will have a mock test at um, day four so we can grade that and see where we are. Uh, there's other, there's two prep books that I do recommend. I have some uh, YouTube videos that I think are very good to show examples. Sometimes I try to use different ways to live, I mean, excuse me, to uh, talk about the, the key strategies or the terms. Uh, this can be an online training. So sometimes you'll go to a classroom and then sometimes uh, you'll do a virtual training and I do both. And um, in fact, I'm, I'm offering an online training next week, but yes, virtual or online. And then there is in-class or in-person training. Okay, well, I just wanna thank all of you for um, you know taking the initiative to come to this. This is the first step. Uh, please be in contact with Jenny for any further questions she can get, she will, be able to contact me and I can write personally and respond to you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lecteron really thanks you for your attention and um, we hope to help you uh, achieve your PMP. Thank you and I'm going to stop the meeting now and uh, have a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>